and welcome to Prairie Pulse. Coming up a little bit later in the, sh the show, we'll have a story uh, from Inside Energy on Colorado's so-called fracking election. But first, joining me now is Dr. Michael Yellowbird. Uh, Dr. Yellowbird, thanks so much for joining us today. Well, thanks for now, having me. Now, you're the new director of NDSU's Indigenous Tribal Studies Program. And we're going to learn more about that as we go through the show today. But first off, tell the folks a little bit about yourself, your background, where you're originally from. Um, okay, uh, let me just make one clarification. It's, um, we've changed the name recently. It's called Tribal and Indigenous People Studies. So okay. it's like TIPS, that's kind of the acronym, um, Tribal Indigenous People Studies. Um, okay. Uh, a question was where, I was where I'm from. Yeah, your background. Uh, my background, um, well, it's the academic background I have. Uh, I've uh, been teaching um, at a number of universities for the last past 22 years. I was, my first position was uh, teaching uh, at the University of uh, British Columbia in Vancouver, Canada. Um, I'm a social work um, scholar and faculty um, person by training. So I was there for a couple of years and then I did a couple of uh, tours at the University of Kansas um, in Lawrence, and then I was at uh, Arizona State University, and most recently I was at Humboldt State University in uh, Arcata, California. So I uh, arrived in, in Fargo in August to uh, take up this new position, so that's a bit of my academic background. Uh, my personal background is I'm actually a Rikaran Hidatsa um, from uh, the Fort Berthold Reservation, from a little town called White Shield, which is sort of nestled in on the eastern uh, part of the uh, reservation. Grew up in a big family, about 15, well, 15 of us, 11 boys, four girls, same mom and dad, and uh, grew up in that community for about the first 15 years of my life. Uh, and after that, I was uh, off to school, boarding school at New England, St. Mary's, and uh, from there on, I was in, in, at the university studying uh, for, for a number of years before, until I uh, finished my PhD at the University of uh, well, Wisconsin in Madison, so. Okay, well, good. Uh, now, now t tell us then about the origin of the program, and uh, yeah, just tell us about it. Well, um, as I understand, the uh, the origin of this program is uh, was was um, came together uh, with a number of faculty at NDSU who decided that you know uh, NDSU was one of the major universities uh, um, uh, in the Midwest that didn't have an American Indian Studies program, and so they began to have a, um, some discussions about that and uh, decided that. You know, it was it was important to have a program, and then they began to try to, you know, have they had been having these conversations about what would a program look like or what would it should it be about, and I think the uh, conversations led more toward um, thinking about you know something that was uh, more diverse and, and more expansive than the current Native American and American Indian Studies program. So they focused more on. Um, trying to begin the development of a program that would be more global in nature. And so this particular program came about with that kind of thinking and, and um, I interviewed for the job and I have previous experience um, uh, developing a, a major world-class program at the University of Kansas. Uh, uh, it was called the Indigenous Nations Studies Program. So I was one of the, uh, when I was on faculty there in the School of um, Social Work, I was one of the architects uh, of this particular program. So we looked at that program uh, with, a, with, a more, with a much more broad uh, analytical purpose to begin to analyze the circumstances and situations of indigenous people around the world that had undergone all um, a number of uh, different changes because of colonization um, um, and trying to maintain their, um, their indigenous ways of life. So that was a big part of the motivation of uh, uh, that program there in Kansas. Um, and there's a lot more to it than that. But uh, the one at NDSU then decided it would, you know, like a different identity. And so the idea was then again to have this more global approach to look at indigenous people, not only in the Western Hemisphere, but globally. And the idea then, of course, with that is to try to figure out how um, can uh, we develop an academic discipline that focuses on the strengths of indigenous people throughout the world, the belief systems, the values, the culture, the life they live, the ethics that they have in regard to living with one another and occupying a particular uh, different parts of uh, regions of, of, the, of the world and the planet and how they've had uh, these different, um, uh, I don't know, uh, what do you say, interactions with the, not only their environment but with other tribal groups and how they survived and what they've learned over thousands and thousands of years. So mm -hmm. that's kind of the idea. 
Well, you're bringing your expertise with other programs you've started. Now, is this program just getting started here at NDSU? It's, it's, uh, yeah, it's on paper right now. It's getting started, and we're kind of in the real early stages of development, yeah. Okay. So, well, so how is it going so far, then? Well, it's, it's going well, because I think, you know, that um, it's giving me a chance to uh, visit with uh, faculty and some of the administration on campus and students and to talk about, like, what would be the goals and the vision of such a program and, and um, I'm getting a chance to travel to um, some of the different tribal colleges around the region and tribal communities to have these conversations about what would something um, uh, like a, a tribal indigenous studies people's program uh, look like to you? What, what value would it have? How could we um, develop a program that would have um, different kinds of um, 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 aspects to it that would serve the community better. Um, I mean, that, and that's really the goal of it, is to have these conversations with people. In my own mind, I have, you know, sort of a, a pretty clear idea of what, what this academic program would do, and that would be like uh, developing the next wave of indigenous uh, leaders and scholars and practitioners and researchers um, to uh, begin to articulate uh, what a vision would look like for the future of indigenous studies, but also to begin to use uh, novel theories that would help to describe, you know, uh, and explain and contribute to um, some of the dilemmas we are in as a, as a global society, be they ecological disasters or war or, um, you know, uh, planetary changes with uh, climate change. There's a lot to be learned from indigenous cultures. And uh, that's one of the um, experiences that I've had is uh, I've been very fortunate to have read a huge body of research as well as narratives, stories, and conversations that indigenous people have had around the world concerning, you know, just a myriad of different kinds of issues and topics. And also have had the opportunity to travel uh, globally to sit down and visit with village elders, mm -hmm. um, scholars, activists, um, um, graduate students to um, align uh, with them um, kind of very similar thinking about how our different cultures and beliefs and value systems can contribute to uh, a more sustainable and um, um, uh, well-being on the planet, you know, society, I guess is what I'm For talking sure. about. So. Well, now, do you have students enrolled yet, or is this, when will it, uh, how many students would you expect when you get the well, program going? Well, uh, right now, what we're doing is we're, uh, we're, we're establishing a minor. Okay. And the minor will have uh, some courses that will relate to an introduction to what are, you know, uh, tribal and indigenous people studies. Um, you know, what does it look like regionally and, and um, along with some other courses. So we'll establish a minor um, and that, that should happen fairly quickly. Uh, the grand plan, of course, is in the next uh, year or so um, to begin work on a full-fledged um, academic graduate program where we can begin to attract um, students from around the, the world, really, to come into here to study at, at this place and to begin um, uh, articulating sort of their own interests um, and, and looking at a curriculum that we develop and then using uh, their own knowledge um, base of from where they come from, how to combine what we're teaching along with their, their uh, cultural knowledge and that sort of thing, so. Hmm. Well, then let's, you've got a grand plan there, so I'm trying to put it all in, but what would a, a student do, what kind of career path would they take with, with a degree like this? Well, you know, there's so many things I think that they could do. Um, some of them would be, uh, come, I suppose, political leaders in their community, where they would have all of the, uh, the different kinds of um, um, background in uh, what, what it means to study political systems, for example. Uh, they would study, of course, you know, American systems and, and sort of first world uh, um, political systems, look at, you know, the strengths and the weaknesses of those. And they may look at a lot of indigenous uh, systems uh, that exist around the, uh, around the world and then sort of combine kind of a hybrid of uh, uh, systems that, you know, uh, may make more sense in today's you know, globalized uh, world. That's one thing they would do because they'd have that background uh, as scholars and researchers and and have a lot of knowledge that they could carry forward as leaders. <clears throat> uh, another area um, I'm hoping that we could do um, some, I mean there's so many, uh, just uh, another example is there's so many things that could be learned from indigenous people and um, their nutritional um, um, ancestral eating um, um, habits and, and uh, life uh, culture. Mm -hmm. uh, right now that's, uh, people are looking at that in um, a lot of uh, different ways in terms of uh, what's happened to us as a, a society, as an industrialized society where 
the, the health has sort of just dropped, you know, and we suffer with all kinds of chronic diseases and illnesses, cancers and uh, autoimmune disorders. A lot of it um, is because of um, living in the so-called modern, modernized, industrialized world. Uh, when you look at indigenous cultures around the world, you find that they have uh, nowhere near the um, amount of autoimmune disorders like asthma or any other kinds of uh, autoimmune disorders, you know, skin disorders mm -hmm. or whatever. Uh, they have less mental health problems. Uh, they have less um, obesity and chronic, you know, uh, things like um, um, diabetes and all those kinds of things. So I'm hoping that students can come in there and study that and then become the next wave of practitioners that will kind of disseminate this knowledge and information to communities so that communities will be able to kind of transition quickly, I hope, back from, you know, uh, what's become a, a really sort of uh, fatalistic path, um, living um, on the standard American diet, for instance, and eating and consuming foods that are really bad for our health and transition back into uh, eating ancestral foods and um, cultivating, you know, foods in a, in a more indigenous way. So uh, those things, you know, everything from health to economics to politics to, um, environment, um, all those kinds of things are all going to be encompassed in a program like this because the idea is to keep it an interdisciplinary program where students will learn about all kinds of theory, all kinds of um, practices and so on. Mm -hmm. You know, you've spoken uh, about many things at conferences over the year, I understand. Uh, can you talk about some of that research and, and maybe, you know, we just start off with what is decolonization, a, a, a subject you've spoken about? Sure. Uh, well, decolonization is, is uh, something that you don't hear a lot about in the United States. It's not really um, a term or um, um, an, uh, an academic um, a concept that, that um, um, uh, American scholars write about. It's, it's pretty far off the, um, um, the radar screen for a lot of American non-indigenous scholars because most people don't see America as an occupied territory. They don't see it as a colonized territory or they don't relate it to what we now call like in uh, post-colonial studies or in decolonized uh, decolonization studies, a settler society. Um, a settler society meaning that, you know, um, indigenous people that are here that are um, uh, native to these lands are still um, occupied by um, people that from the outside that came from Europe or Africa or wherever they came from and are occupying indigenous territory. Um, um, in the global uh, analysis of this, you have countries that have been decolonized like um, India, for instance, that was under British occupation. Uh, South Africa, which was also under occupation, Hong Kong under British occupation. Um, so the idea here is, is to begin to articulate, like, what does that mean to be under occupation? What does that mean to have uh, independence and sovereignty? And <clears throat> when, when we understand uh, the term colonization and settler colonialism, we recognize that indigenous people um, who are uh, living under occupation have a very difficult time managing and sustaining their sovereignty and their self-determination. And so, and um, those populations that have been colonized around the world um, share a lot of the same characteristics, whether they're from New Zealand, Australia, Canada, the United States, some of the Pacific Rim um, 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 territories that are out there. Many of them share a lot of these characteristics where there's a lot of uh, 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 social issues, um, a lot of um, uh, problems uh, in the in the society, uh, things like substance abuse, alcoholism, um, um, a lot of problems that were never there before the period of colonization. So decolonization then sets forth a program and um, a research agenda that begins to try to uh, help indigenous people understand their circumstances under a colonial context, and then to make um, changes. Uh, where they begin to readopt different kinds of strategies, life ways, culture, uh, language, and things that help them begin to recover their um, their well-being and their balance and and their um, their their uh, cultural uh, uh, you know strengths that they have. So that decolonization is really about re uh, language recovery, le relearning history. Um, it's about relearning um, how to do the things that maybe several generations ago that people did that were sustainable and um, to begin to unplug from a society that a colonized society that can be very devastating to the well-being of indigenous people. 
Dr. Yellowbird, we're running out of time here, so I want to get to a couple more questions here. But, you know, you, you taught at, at Kansas State and Humboldt, uh, or Univers Kansas University and Humboldt State yes. most recently, but h is it similar, uh, what you did there, as to what you're going to do here? I, I, no, I think, um, I, well, there, when I was at uh, Humboldt and I was at Kansas, um, part of the time at Kansas, I was a social work professor. Now I'm getting back to being a professor of uh, tribal indigenous studies. Um, that in itself, uh, for me is, is um, very satisfying because in, as a social work professor, I, I did a lot of uh, work with students and talked a lot about empowerment, community change, and talked about how um, you know, social workers could use their skills to, you know, to begin uh, some kind of structural um, you know, um, uh, reformation of the system so, you know, uh, so people could have social justice, right? But social work in my uh, opinion has become a very uh, uh, industrialized um, profession. It's an industry that has a lot of rules, regulations, certifications, licensing, and um, it doesn't allow social workers to do, you know, really what they teach them. On the other hand, indigenous studies, um, I think that the field is wide open, and I think that we're going to see indigenous studies pick up the torch where a lot of these other professions that have tried to help indigenous people have come to a dead end. I think that these young people that are, we're going to bring into the, uh, the uh, community uh, or of, of uh, scholars are going to be the next level of people that are going to change you know, the world for indigenous people because they, have, they are stakeholders in these communities. They love these communities and, they're, and they are willing to go and do whatever it takes to create change. Yeah. Dr. Yellowbird, we need to have you back on in a year or two after you get the program up and running. Thank you. Thanks so much for joining us today. Thank you. Stay tuned for more. Prairie Public is pleased to be partnering with our public broadcasting friends in Colorado and Wyoming on the Inside Energy series of TV and radio reports. Today we have a story about Colorado's upcoming so-called fracking election that explores the tension among environmentalists with both Democrats and Republicans and what it could mean for the national debate on new oil and gas drilling techniques. I found out that they were going to be fracking all around Union Reservoir. 70-year-old great-grandmother Kay Fissinger is a busy woman these days. She's been fighting for the last three years to protect the town she loves from fracking, the technique of pumping pressurized water deep underground to fracture rock and extract oil and natural gas. So we don't have drilling and fracking yet here, and that's because of the ban. The ban was Fissinger was eager to show us this reservoir at the edge of Longmont, where companies have been trying to put in a series of gas wells. They'll be fracking all around here, where, where people play. She's worried it will soon look like so many other places along Colorado's Front Range, with drill towers and wellheads cropping up next to homes at an unprecedented rate. Activists like Fissinger, in a handful of communities just north of Denver, succeeded in keeping this boom away from their doorsteps by lobbying at the local level. The Longmont City Council voted to restrict where wells could be built a couple of years ago. A few months later, residents took it a step further, passing a ban on fracking altogether. The state government immediately launched two lawsuits against Longmont for this, and it fired up a grassroots citizens movement for a statewide initiative to give local communities more control over fracking. People are most concerned about what it means for their quality of life. The activist cause got a big financial boost when their congressman and former tech entrepreneur Democrat Jared Polis decided to bankroll the so-called local control initiatives. Local versus state control has become the crux of the fight over fracking both in Colorado and around the country. What I think it should be left to is each community to decide. I think, and we have many communities, one of the counties uh, nearby, Weld County, it's an important part of their economy. Uh, other areas that I represent have voted to ban it. Uh, I think those votes should be respected. It's like any other kind of industrial operation. I think it's uh, up to communities to decide if they want to incorporate that into their economic development strategy or not. But party Democrats did not want the initiatives to make the November ballot and the pressure on Polis to back down kept mounting, says University of Denver political science professor Peter Hansen. From a political standpoint, um, the fracking initiatives were going to make life very difficult for the Democrats this fall. Mark Udall and, and Governor Hickenlooper are facing very competitive races. And for Senator Udall or the governor to open themselves up to accusations 
um, that uh, they were somehow opposed to energy development and jobs in the state uh, would have been politically quite dangerous for them. Colorado is sitting on vast reserves of shale. They can provide huge amounts of oil and natural gas through an environmentally safe process called fracking. Even before the initiatives had gained enough signatures to make the ballot, the industry was already spending millions of dollars in advertising to fight them. It means jobs for Colorado. The ad spending showdown over the measures was expected to total tens of millions, breaking state records. For responsible energy development. Energy extraction and our environment and managing the balance can be difficult but it's something we've always been able to do in Colorado. Last month, like Governor John Hickenlooper announced he had reached a compromise between some major environmental organizations and industry groups. The state would drop one of the lawsuits against Longmont. Congressman Polis would drop his two ballot initiatives. The oil and gas industry would drop two pro-fracking initiatives. And a new so-called Blue Ribbon Commission would be appointed to craft a solution on local control issues for the state legislature. This approach will put the matter in the hands of a balanced group of thoughtful community leaders, business representatives, and citizens who can advise the legislature and the executive branch on the best path forward. Business and industry groups have long argued the state is best equipped to regulate the oil and gas industry to avoid a hodgepodge of regulations where all of those, all those red dots are wells. Matt Lepore heads up the Colorado Oil and Gas Conservation Commission, the state agency which regulates the industry. Part of what's going on, I think is important for everybody to understand, is that these cities and communities are expanding. What was once just rural agricultural land, subdivisions get developed. If, if today the local governments chose to say, no drilling in our residential zone, what about tomorrow? when the residential zone has moved again out to where drilling was okay. okay. Lepore says the governor was right to broker the compromise. Would you go so far as to say you breathe a sigh of relief? I think that, yes, I did, and I think Colorado should have breathed a sigh of relief too, to be honest. The state is, in my opinion, uniquely equipped to regulate oil and gas, both in terms of the expertise that we have and the resources that we have and the long history of regulating it that we have. The state of Colorado has been a leader in requiring oil and gas companies to disclose fracking fluid information and to control methane emissions at the wells. Representative Polis doesn't think that's enough. He wishes Governor Hickenlooper's compromise would have gone further, but he says it was better than gambling in November. So absolutely better than rolling the dice with an initiative that may or may not pass, having uh, oil and gas company sponsored initiatives on the ballot as well, which could have been a setback for protecting our environment and our homeowners. Uh, this provides some certainty, a few steps forward, uh, and a process in place that hopefully will allow us to, uh, to solve this issue in the future. But the anti-fracking crowd attacked Polis for caving to political pressures. If you could sum it up, sum yeah, up your feelings. Yeah, uh, betrayal. Betrayal. Kay Fissinger, a lifelong Democrat, says the whole thing is forcing her to leave the party. Be a cold day in hell before I vote for Hickenlooper. Not for somebody who betrays us like that, who sues us twice, uh, you know, with our own money. No less. Uh, how could I? And it, would, it would so violate my integrity to vote for this man. So there, there's a green candidate and I'll vote for him. You felt that compromise was a subversion of? The democratic process, yeah. Ready, are you ready? Gwen Lackolt is a lifelong environmentalist and county commissioner from the southwestern part of Colorado. She's not abandoning the process yet. She too supported the local control measures and the compromise left her with mixed emotions. I had both a sense of disappointment and also a sense of this Blue Ribbon Commission could really be an opportunity for not only Colorado, but for other states that are dealing with this issue. Governor Hickenlooper is tasking Lackalt to co-chair the new commission, which is charged with resolving these conflicts over local control. Lackalt says industry can't ignore the issue anymore. If the oil and gas industry refuses this time to address the people's concerns, they will lose their social license to operate. And the people of Colorado will take matters in their own hands. If this commission fails, 
or the legislature fails to enact the recommendations from this commission in 2015, I say get ready for 2016. In the meantime, the industry is continuing to drill new wells at a furious pace in many parts of the state. The people of Longmont look to you tonight. And the citizens of Longmont are continuing to fight to keep their fracking ban. This ban has become more than just a ban on hydraulic fracturing. It has become a statement of democracy for and by the people. Residents spoke up at a recent city council meeting with impassioned pleas after a district judge declared the ban unconstitutional. Council members voted unanimously to appeal that ruling. Well, that's all we have on Prairie Pulse for this week. And as always, thanks for watching. Inside Energy is a project of Prairie Public in cooperation with public broadcasters in Colorado and Wyoming. Funded in part by the Corporation for Public Broadcasting. See more at InsideEnergy.org. And by the members of Prairie Public.